Welcome to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. I know for all of you that were looking to hear Simon's soft, sultry voice, you might as well tune out right now and just go home and cry, because you're not going to find him this week, unfortunately. But he will be back next week. Lord willing, he had a previous obligation pop up at the last moment down in the big city of Chicago. Uh, I can't really reveal many details about it, although I can say that it does involve his acting career. So, uh, Simon, we hope that your uh, potential potential possibility uh, down there in the big city works out for you, and we uh, look forward to having him back on the show next week. Uh, A quick reminder for all of you wonderful people that you can get us right here on Sports Radio America from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern. You can also get us on Periscope whenever the heck we decide to do these shows. For those of you that have been paying attention, it's usually been on Wednesdays, so uh, you just have to stare at me uh, tonight on Periscope if you feel like it. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. So I appreciate the few people that are on Periscope right now. Remember, if you are on Periscope, make sure to ask questions, chime in with your thoughts. You'll definitely be mentioned on the air. Hello, CPLAS10. Thank you for watching and listening. And um, so many other things that we do as well. Uh, You can also get the show on demand as well on iHeartRadio, on iTunes, and on Spreaker.com as well. Uh, You can also find us on social media on Facebook at 2UpFront. And you can also find us on Twitter at 2UpFrontSoccer. I am at Baxter Colburn. And Simon is at Simon Provan. Remember, the Q in Baxter is silent for all of you out there. No, there's no Q in Baxter, I promise. Anyway, so... um, Usually at this time of the show, uh, Simon and I would be hashing things out, talking. Uh, For those of you that also know, um, Corey Plath has been on as a a co-host in the past as well, along with other people. Uh, Corey wasn't available tonight either, so uh, I had to go all the way to Seattle to find my co-host for the night. I actually have two of them, believe it or not. So uh, straight from Seattle, we have Vavil USA's soccer finest with me. It is Matthew Ryan Evans and Chris Blakely of Vavil USA. Good evening, gentlemen, from the West Coast to the Central. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good, Chris. Matt, how are you, sir? I am wonderful. Glad to be here. I definitely realized as soon as I said that, I'm like, they can't see me. They can only hear me. So I have no (laughs) idea who's going to say hi first. This could get real interesting. Uh, My well, goodness. you know, that's what we're here for, to make exactly. it interesting for you and your listeners. Thank you. I appreciate that. How have you guys been? I haven't talked to you guys in forever. Chris, what's new with you, sir? Uh, you know, same old, same old. Uh, I finally got done crying after that defeat against <laughs> FC Dallas. And, uh... <laughs> oh, I thought you were still crying after your loss to Arizona on Sunday Night Football. Uh, yeah. Different different time, uh, different tantrum, different, different bottle different of beer. Different tears, you know. It's, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's been good. Uh, kind of sad, you know. Sport seasons winding down, and uh, that's true. Finally, getting over being sick as well. So you know, it's just one of those things. Now, I'm curious, as both a Sounders and Seahawks fan, when which team loses pains you more? You know, that's a really good question. You know, that, I've never really thought about that. But huh. to be honest with you, especially with the way the Sounders lost, I mean, that was definitely heartbreaking. That is um, true. Yes. Honestly, in in regards to the Seahawks, I mean, it's the NFL. I mean, every team's good. They're the best in the world. And, you know, it's just one of those things. You know what? Secretly, between us three, of course, I kind of hope they don't make the playoffs this year. That way we can get some of these fans that think they know everything out of here and we can get back to the way it used to be. Interesting. Wow. Matt, how do you feel about that? I agree completely. You know, it's... There's a lot of things that we need to do to, to get ourselves back to where we need to be, and we need to get some of these guys that are, you know, 12 since 12 off the bandwagon. <laughs> Is that like a hashtag in Seattle or something, 12 since 12? Yeah, kind of, it's, it's how us uh, old fans, uh, you know, refer to the new fans. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I definitely agree with your sentiments, though, on that one in terms of uh, the bandwagoners. It's time for them to to get out of Dodge and actually let the real fans celebrate the the legacy that is Seattle because that's one thing you always hear folks nowadays is like, I'm a diehard Seattle Seahawks fan. I'm like, really? Can you tell me anybody that's played for Seattle before 2012? And they're like, oh, sure, Russell Wilson. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> well, yeah, like, that's, that's my – and I think, you know, obviously with success, that's going to happen with every team. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can't tell me all these Patriot fans were Patriot fans before Bill Belichick true. showed up. but. My biggest gripe, though, with that is the fact that 
I've been a fan since 1988, since I was five years old. Wow, okay. Now, That's how I am with the Green Bay Packers as well. I've been a Packers fan since I knew who Brett Favre was. It irritates me because I get called a bandwagon fan, and it just throws it, it, it boils my blood. But enough about that. <laughs> Apparently, yes, exactly. I mean, enough about football with two O's. Let's talk about football with the U. So both of you gentlemen are uh, editors and uh, division heads over at Vavil USA. If you haven't been to Vavil USA, go check out all the great work that Chris and Matt and their staff do over there. Uh, a lot of good reads, a lot of good writers as well. Uh, a lot of things we're going to talk about on the show today are going to center around American soccer. However, as we usually start every show, we travel across the great uh, Atlantic to the European nations, and we check in with what's going on over there in England and around the European and Asian soccer world. So uh, first things first, uh, the Euro 2016, uh, the 24 teams have finally been established, and um, the draw doesn't happen until mid-December, however, uh, but the four pots are officially announced, and uh, people are already starting to, to talk and to try to decipher you know, who is going to end up winning, who the best teams are. And, uh, you know, at this point, I mean, uh, Matt, I want to start with you. Uh, what have your takeaways been so far from the qualifiers and just normal things that you've noticed about these, uh, this tournament before it hasn't even officially kicked off? Well, it's going to be very interesting in this tournament, uh, especially with the, uh, the expansion to 24 teams. It's going to be really good to see teams like Albania and Wales and Iceland and even Northern Ireland, you know, join the fray that haven't gotten there before. And... I'm, uh, you know, we had some really exciting, uh, exciting play this last week with Sweden making it in. Uh, Absolutely, just having to hold on against Denmark there, and you know, Hungary making it in as well. Um, I think it's premature right now to actually talk about who can win the tournament, just because we need to see what the the uh, the draws will look like. Because you know, I mean, if you're looking at it right now, going, oh well, England can win the tournament, but mm-hmm. if they're matched up with you know Sweden, Turkey, and Italy, then you know, I mean. <laughs> that talks all premature right there, but I mean, sure. if you're in a group with Austria, Hungary, and, you know, Iceland, then I mean, you know, then their chances are, are, are a lot better than they would be. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that one. Uh, one of the big debates that is swirling around right now, and Chris, I'll ask you this first, uh, do you think that France, in light of everything that's going on with uh, ISIS and the uh, terrible attacks that have been uh, on Paris, should still host this tournament next year? <sighs> you know, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, honestly... Part of me says yes, the other part of me says no, but it uh, it would be very, very hard. Well, actually, it probably wouldn't be that hard to change countries. True. Um, I know, as an example, back in the early 2000s, the Women's FIFA World Cup was supposed to be in China, but due to the, I believe it was the SARS outbreak, they moved it back to the U.S. because they previously right, died. Yep. I mean, there is that possibility, and uh, you know, FIFA is obviously going to do what's best for them and their fans, hopefully. Um, and, and not, <laughs> honestly, it's still a year away. So it is. That's it, the thing. A lot, a lot of things can happen in the world, both exactly. domestic, both you know, in soccer and just in politics and as a whole. Uh, and somebody on Periscope says that if they do switch it, ISIS definitely kind of wins that battle. They they do what they came to do, unfortunately, and that's something I'm sure folks don't want to see happen. I mean, even the draw that's going to be taking place December 12th will be in Paris, and I'm sure that will be a highly guarded event, and I'm sure security will be up the wazoo with all the FIFA officials that will be in the building. But, I mean, between the three of us and the billions of listeners listening, I mean, if some of those FIFA officials happen to go missing, you know, oops. Anyway, no, that's that's a terrible that's a terrible thing to say. Come on, now, who would who would say such a thing? Um, but anyway, looking looking at the four pots uh, right now. So pot one is France, Spain, Germany, England, Portugal, and Belgium. Those are six of the best teams in the world. Uh, you maybe throw Argentina and Brazil in there, and aside from that, those are the six best teams in the world. Would you guys disagree on that? No, not at all. Matt, what are your thoughts? I think that uh, I would put Italy over Portugal, to be honest with you, on the top eight. Interesting. But, uh, okay. You know, I mean, Portugal's done well in, in Euros, but they, you know, they've struggled uh, recently. And, you know, I mean, their aging core, or their players are getting older with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and Luis Nani and, and those guys. So I haven't seen anybody uh, coming up that's really impressed me. So, you know, 
I would, uh, I'd probably say Italy over Portugal would be my, in my top eight. Interesting. Yeah, no, I can definitely see where you'd be coming from on that perspective. As a fellow Italiano, I think I kind of feel the same way as well about that. So looking at the remainder of the pots, pot two is Italy, as we mentioned, Matt. Switzerland, Croatia, Austria, Russia, and the Ukraine. Pot three is the Czech Republic, Sweden, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Hungary. And the final pot, the, the six teams, aside from Wales, that are just happy to be there, are Turkey, Ireland, Iceland, Wales, Albania, and Northern Ireland. So, um, as we mentioned, the draw will be featuring on December 12th. At this point, I, I'm trying to put in my head what the group of death could be. Uh, my thought initially would be an, a Germany, Italy, Sweden, Wales combination i think would maybe be as about as bad as you can get it or is there a different combination chris that you would maybe go with uh you know i i could agree with that but he also i mean Bel- i mean if you swap out anybody for pot one you know you put belgium in there and include those other three teams you just mentioned i mean that could belgium i mean they are the number one uh, or actually you know what i have to double check the fifa rankings but i know fifa was, well those are uh, skewed anyway so it doesn't matter what you say about that yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so in your in your mind, in your FIFA rankings, in Vavil USA's FIFA rankings, you know, you guys should do your own rankings, I think. Yeah, you know, one, I, one day. <laughs> think, you know, wouldn't be the worst idea. I, I'd read those articles. Anyway, um, no, I, I mean, looking at this, uh, Matt, do you have any other teams? I mean, I feel like Germany's the best team in pot one, realistically. I would say, yeah, I'd agree with you. Germany's the best team in pot one. I think that the only uh, one you could switch out would maybe Wales and Turkey. Turkey's just, you know, just a rough and tumble team that can, you know, make anybody uh, play off of their game. So I would think that uh, that you know that combination of Germany, Germany, Italy, Sweden, and and Turkey could be could be a crazy one. I'm just excited to see Ibrahimovic uh, get in the tournament. He's right, be able to it's about time. Holy cow! I was so upset when they didn't make the World Cup, and now Zlatan. I am Zlatan. We'll be back finally in a major tournament, and I am so excited to see what Sweden is capable of doing. Uh, you can make arguments that Poland might be the best in pot three, though, uh, as a complete team. When you've got guys like Robert Lewandowski running up and down the side for you, I mean, that kind of strikes fear into the heart of any team. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So, all right. Well, uh, aside from this, though, uh, the Euros are going to be an exciting time. The, the tournament doesn't take place until next summer, so... Uh, once the draw is officially announced on December 12th, I'm sure there'll be multiple speculations of who will win, uh, what's going on. Uh, I, I don't mind the 24 teams as well, as you guys have mentioned. I think it's a great move for uh, the for the tournament as a whole. allows teams like Albania and Iceland and Northern Ireland even to get in as well. Uh, I'm really excited to see what Wales does. I think Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey and company have a very good squad, and I think they could surprise a few people this uh, this tournament as well. Now, uh, one of the other things I want to talk about that is a little bit more domestic in the international game, uh, honing in just on Spain, for anybody that has ever followed the game of soccer at one point ever in your life, um, you may have heard of a guy named Ronaldo and a guy named Messi. Uh, Matt, have you have those names ever come across your keyboard swiping at all? Um, these guys are news to me. Uh... Tell me a little bit about them. You might You might have to Google them. Um, Messi is uh, pretty shifty with his feet. Ronaldo has good abs. That's about all. They, that's about their claims uh, to fame. Okay, yeah, I've heard of Ronaldo's abs. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that if you Google search Ronaldo's abs, I'm sure that there's many pictures. Um, anyway, but uh, the latest... Make sure you're not at work. <laughs> that, that's one of those not for work, uh, not suitable for work kind of things, you know. Uh <laughs> Wow. Anyway, um, but one of the things that is recently surfaced is that uh, Messi and Ronaldo are both heavily rumored to be headed to England after the end of this coming season. Chris, um, Messi's rumored to go to Arsenal, of all places, and Ronaldo is, retur- is rumored to go back to Old Trafford. What are your thoughts about these possible rumors, and how much weight do they actually carry? Well, I mean, honestly, any rumors really don't hold any weight until they become true, right? Uh, that's usually how it works, but it gives people <laughs> no. like us something to talk about. Well, no, exactly. I mean, it, it makes it for an interesting conversation. I mean, and also every year we hear that Ronaldo keeps talking about towards the end of his career coming to MLS. I mean, you know, it, it's just one of those things that it would definitely make their team, you know, the Spanish teams and their league. I just drew a blank on their name, but their league, sorry. but um, La Liga. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, it would. I, I personally, I think it might make them a little bit lesser, and it would make the EPL, you know, stronger. I mean, they're. I mean, honestly, they're the best league in the world. Yes. It, that that's my opinion. Um, then you got Germany, you know, the Bundesliga, and then I think the Liga comes in third. But if they were to make that transition, I mean, it's only going to make. I mean, Manchester United always, besides you know, maybe the last year or two, are usually in the top four. Uh, Arsenal would maybe, you know. Get over that hump if they were to add somebody like a Messi. You know? I'd agree. I mean, got- I, it just it seems weird for me as someone that's followed Arsenal the last few years. I'm curious where Arsenal. Maybe this is what Arsenal has been doing by not being active in the transfer market is that they've just been stockpiling droves of money so that way they can finally go after Messi. I think I read a report saying that Messi wants one million dollars a week in his oh, in his wow. in his salary. I believe it's it's Messi or Ronaldo. Oh, I don't remember which one it is. I but- think no. I remember seeing something earlier this week about Messi, and I, I want to say it was around six hundred thousand, but that was like on Monday or Sunday. I read it, so it could have okay. gone up. Yeah, since that's nine hundred is what the number is apparently. So, wow. uh, even I mean, I mean, I would take that. I'll, I'll take nine hundred thousand dollars a week. I mean, shoot, that's that's a great life wow. to live. My just God. Pay your taxes, man. Just pay your taxes. Yeah, right. Good luck with that. I wonder if that's another thing, though, too, of why Messi might want to get out of Spain sooner rather than later is that he does he has had all of those financial issues. Uh, with tax evasion, so maybe he thinks that if he goes to England, that might help loosen um, his punishment or maybe show that he's willing to get a more sustainable income from somewhere else so he can pay those things back. But, uh, Matt, what are your thoughts about Ronaldo and Messi possibly moving to England? I think it'd be great. You know, um, England, the English Premier League has more of a global reach um, television-wise than, uh, than La Liga does. And I think that it's something that could even more boost their celebrity. <clears throat> also, I mean, like you said, uh, Leo Messi going to Arsenal, I mean, just that that could finally uh, end their title drought there. Um, yeah, no kidding. And, uh, Ronaldo going back to Manchester United, I mean, that would just be an absolutely wonderful story there. I and mean, he's, you know, beloved there. And it should, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be wonderful. I, I'd be totally fine with both of those guys going to the EPL. Mostly just because then I wouldn't have to go find, you know, some shady stream online to watch them play. <laughs> Shit, I love that. No, that's very true. I mean, we would actually get to see some of the best players in the world playing on ESPN and NBC Sports and FS1 and Fox Soccer Channel and whatever weird other channels. Fox Sports, you know, 46 is what the U.S. men's national team games are usually carried on. Um, but And that does possibly open up the door a little bit, too, for an MLS move later on in their careers as well. We've, Like you guys have mentioned, um, Ronaldo is rumored, I swear, every other day to either David Beckham United or the Galaxy or the Red Bulls. I've even heard him maybe going to LAFC as well. But at the end of the day, they're going to go for where they can get the most money now, not where they can get the most money in five years. Yep, exactly. Yep. So, all right. Well, uh, Arsenal, Manchester United, maybe. That is that is a big possibility. Uh, I don't know if it's going to end up happening or not. Messi more than Ronaldo especially, but uh, it's the world of soccer. Anything's possible. But we're going to jump to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how the wonderful U.S. men's national team did in their first two World Cup qualifying games. And Chris and Matt are going to help me figure out what exactly the state of U.S. soccer is right now. You're not going to want to miss that along with our MLS awards. What the heck's going on in Seattle? And, of course, our predictions for the first leg of the conference championships in Major League Soccer. Don't, mo- don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more here on 2 Up Front.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. Simon is off for the week as he is out of town doing some exciting things for his acting career. So we wish Simon all the best and look forward to having his semi-slanted Portland bias back on the show next week. No, we, we appreciate who he is as a person and uh, his wonderful insights into the soccer world. Remember, you can listen to the show right here on Sports Radio America from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern on SportsRadioAmerica.com, live 365 and tune in. And you can get us on demand anytime you want on Spreaker.com, on iTunes. Go download our podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, any soccer lovers, and uh, you can also get us on iHeartRadio as well. A uh, cool story to share really fast before we bring back um, our two co-hosts for the day, uh, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans. Uh, a good friend of the show, his name is Simon Mitchell. Uh, you may have heard him on the show in the past talking about European soccer. Uh, he messaged me the other day saying that he was in a pub in, uh, in Norwich, where he's from, and uh, he was chatting with a guy, and he found out that he was from Kansas City. They started talking about you know soccer and baseball and American sports and everything, and uh, Simon was like, yeah, I've got some friends back in the States that do a soccer podcast, and the guy was like, oh, really? What's that? What's it called? And uh, he was like, oh, it's called Two Up Front, and, my, and the guy that was like, oh, yeah, I know Two Up Front. It's a great show, and I was like, and he was like, really? How do you know what Two Up Front is? So that just goes to show you that apparently people are listening to Two Up Front all over the country and all over the world, apparently, so... Whoever you random person are from Kansas City, sorry about the Kansas City Chiefs, but congratulations about the Royals and starting about sporting Kansas City. But thank you for listening to Up Front and uh, for sharing it around the world. So with that being said, I want to welcome back in Vavil USA soccer editor and department heads, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans, back to the show. Good evening, gentlemen. Chris and Matt, how are you doing, guys? Good. Are you guys there? Good. Are, we, no, are, we doing, are we doing this wanna, again? I didn't want to step over. We're doing sorry. this again. We're doing this again. <laughs> we did this in the beginning too. I mean, when I, when uh, I bring you in, I mean, let's just next time, Chris, you will go first. Matt, you will go second. Sound good? Okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe, I feel like we need to do it again. You know, Chris and Matt, Chris, how are you, Chris? I'm doing well. How are you? Whoa, here? I am fantastic. And Matt, how are you, sir? <laughs> I am doing wonderful. Holy how are you doing? cow! I am over the moon excited to talk about. What the hell is going on with the U.S. men's national team? Because, frankly, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you guys know what's going on. Jurgen Klinsmann sure as hell doesn't know what's going on, even though I'm sure he thinks he does. But uh, So looking at it, the U.S. men's national team started their World Cup qualifying. The journey has begun to Russia 2018. Anyway, no one cares right now. But um, So the U.S. absolutely stampedes the U9 soccer team that they played down there, uh, the other day. Uh, they beat them 6-1. No, it was, uh, it was the, the Grenadians. Saint, Saint who? I don't even know who it was because it was that bad of a game. It was St. Vincent and the Grenadines. St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, so they stomped on them 6-1. I'm glad. I'm a little surprised that they scored even one goal. However, that one goal that was scored, let's be honest, was a beautiful goal that was scored. So props to that player that scored the goal. Uh, and he's an S2 player as well. Is yeah, he really? Yeah. Uh, you beat me to it. Dang, small <laughs> claim to fame. What is his name for those that don't know? Olax Anderson, is that, is that it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ola. Alex Anderson. Wow, well, congratulations, yeah. Mr. Anderson. He's, uh, he's very good. I mean, that kid's got some talent, and I, I really hope he stays with S2 and maybe could find some uh, some time with the uh, the first team out in Seattle. I mean, he's if he's got, scoring he's goals like shoot. that. My goodness. So, All right, well, so the U.S. goes out. They score six goals um, against uh, the Grenadines there, and it wasn't really that big of a test for them, honestly. It was nice to see Altador get on the board a few times. Zardes cashed in. It was, it was a whatever game. It was one of those games that if the U.S. didn't win by at least five goals, that I'm sure fans would have been slightly concerned. What I'm more concerned about is the game that took place uh, yesterday, and that would be the United States taking on Trinidad and Tobago, TNT, they're dynamite, uh, as it works. Uh, thank you for catching that. But um, I, I don't know what to say about this game that is uh, kind enough to be rebroadcast on the air. So um, the best things that I can say is that uh, there's absolutely no business that the United States should basically hit every possible post and corner and everything of the, of the opposing team's goal without finding the net at least once. Uh, I think Klinsman still has kind of lost his mind, even though the U.S. dominated in possession 60 to 40. They still got outshot 13 to 6, which kind of blows my mind. 
Uh, I just don't know where the U.S. can go from here. After you play a team like uh, TNT, I wanted to call them Toronto FC. That's, I mean, they probably would have beaten Toronto. I don't, they probably would have lost to Toronto FC, let's be honest. But um, I don't know. Chris, what, are your, what were your takeaways from this game last night? Were you as frustrated as I was? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, as you mentioned, they clearly dominated, you know, possession. You know, uh, they were very, very unlucky to not get at least one goal, if not two. I mean, Zardes hit the hit the crossbar in the 47th minute. Jermaine Jones hit the crossbar in the 78th. I think what they were lacking, it, well, obviously, since they didn't score, they were lacking finishing. Absolutely. Um, but we also... We also we we also know how good Trinidad and Tobago is. Look what they did against Mexico and the Gold Cup this summer. Yeah, you can't I take mean, anything away from them on that sense. They they are a talented squad. I mean, they're the fourth best ring team in in Concacaf. Uh, you know, they're they're fifty fourth in the world. You know, they're only twenty twenty one spaces behind the U.S. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's not really. I'm not. I'm not really shocked of the result. I also kind of figured that Jurgen would be okay coming out zero zero because you know you obviously in Concacaf getting a a road point is huge. That usually you know if you can win your games at home, get your road you know get a point on the road, you're going to go through to the next round typically. True. Um, they're very they're Trinidad and Tobago. They're a talented squad. I mean, it's just they were very unfortunate. They were just lacking finishing, um, other than a few early spots. In the early part of the game, U.S. controlled that game the entire time. I'd agree with you on that one. It's a little disheartening that, you know, they didn't win, but they're at the top of the group with four points. That's true. So you can't argue with that. That is true. Now, Matt, I'm curious to get your thoughts about this. This was a game that did not feature Clint Dempsey, as he is currently not on the roster right now. Did the absence of Clint Dempsey lead to the U.S. men's national team not winning this game? You know, I think that uh, Dempsey being there would have been a positive, uh, obviously. I think that the biggest uh, takeaway from this game, though, at least from my eyes, is that uh, just watching it, you could see that Trinidad knows what their identity is, mm. as opposed to the United States, who we don't even know what our identity is. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Trinidad, uh, you know, what did they do? They used their speed on the wings in Jovan Jones and Cordell Cato. You know, those guys blew by our defenders, and they threw, they threw in crosses to the box to Kenwin Jones, who's a big, tall, physical uh, attacker. I and really then, like Henwin Jones, honestly. Yeah, and with the United States, you know, we didn't really, it wasn't, we didn't have the, the quick touches, you know, we didn't really, you know, our attacks weren't really, you know, it was kind of, it was more counterattack based and whatnot. But once Darlington Nagby came in, you know, we started seeing more of the, you know, one touch, two touch passes in the midfield and kind of cut up Trinidad in the last 20 minutes there. True. No, I, I agree with you on that one. It's, it's very interesting. Um, to look at what the United States did. And folks are always quick to judge what the starting lineup is, who the substitutions are that are made. What did you guys make about the fact of uh, Darlington Nagby coming off the bench and even Bobby Wood as well coming into this game? I'm, I'm good with it. You know, honestly, I've always... God, I'm going to feel dirty for saying this, but I've always liked Darlington Nagby. Oh, uh, how dare you as a Sounders uh, fan! No, he's... Honestly, that, that, that kid is... He's got so much talent. He's a great player. Um, he definitely changed, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the quick. The, when he came onto the field, they went to more of the quick passing, which is what he does with his domestic club in Portland. I mean, they 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 work that triangle passing extremely well. True. Um, he's good. He knows how to read defenses. Uh, I just, I think, and Bobby Wood, honestly, I love that kid. I didn't know anything about him 365 days ago. Wow. But now, you know what? This last year. I mean, obviously, I saw him play, you know, when they played overseas, sure. uh, when they played against Columbia and so forth. I was glad to see him get his start last week, you know, got that goal, which was huge for him. Um, he's got tons of talent. Uh, there's a lot of players that are sitting on that bench that I would love to see play, and now would be the time to do it. Exactly. Instead of waiting until they get to the hex, because they should easily get through this group, but you never know. Um, <laughs> That's very true, yeah, especially with the way Klinsman's lineups go. Most definitely, and I just wish my one my one major complaint is Jurgen likes to play players out of position, and mm. I absolutely hate that. I mean, that's the biggest it, knock against Klinsman, I feel like. Exactly, and as an example, I can remember this. You know, when he when he called up Brad Evans a couple years ago, prior to the twenty fourteen World Cup, he used him at right back. It's like, oh, okay, whatever, that's cool. He did great. He excelled. Yada yeah. yada yada. 
didn't get called in, and then he got sent, you know, came back in for January camps, and all of a sudden jurgen has got him playing center back. It's like, what are you doing? This guy's not a center back. And then, no. lo and behold, his, his domestic club ends up having him do it. But <laughs> Yeah, it's irrelevant. Just, just put him, I mean, Yedlin played his entire career as a right back. Yes, he's great on the wing. His defense needs to work. But you know what? Just keep him in one position and quit moving him around. Exactly. Fabian, John- Fabian Johnson obviously is a better as a left midfielder than a left or right back. So just stop moving guys around. He put Jermaine Jones as a center back last year. That was a disaster. That was so I mean, stupid. As a Revolution players, fan, even Jay Heath yeah, tried exactly. to do that a little bit too. Get players where they belong and just go. They will work out together. They will make it work. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with you on that one. Now, Matt, I'm curious to get your thoughts uh, about the Jassy Zardes, Josie Altador one-two punch. Uh, should we have seen Jordan Morris or Alan Gordon in this game, or were you content with the Zardes Altador lineup? Well, just just to preface this, we should never see Alan Gordon in the game. Uh, <laughs> Anytime <laughs> before the seventy-fifth minute, Alan Gordon does not come in the game. Yeah, but no, I'm good with uh, with Zardes and Altador up front. I mean, you know, Altador is more of a he, he's a big physical guy, and Zardes he's more you know uh, off the off the ball, uh, uses his speed to get by. Um, I think it's a good pairing. It's going to be interesting to see you know how it what 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 it is going forward, especially once Dempsey comes back and once like Aaron Johansson comes back in. And it's just going to be really interesting to see kind of what the depth looks like. Are we going to keep seeing Alan Gordon on the team? Or are we going to see, you know, some younger players come up and get a chance? That is true. No, I, I agree with you on that one. I mean, when I found out that Alan Gordon made the roster, I was like, um, okay, uh, sure. I mean, no, I don't, I don't feel like Alan Gordon deserves to be uh, on the U.S. men's national team. It's great that he's found a little bit of success, but he is an MLS player. He's not an international player, and I don't think he ever will be, honestly. But yeah. looking at uh, Bobby Wood, though, I've always been a firm believer that I think either Jordan Morris and Bobby Wood um, need to be on the field at the same time along with either Altidore or Zardes. I've always been a big fan of having at least three of those four guys on the field at the same time. Uh, I don't know if you guys agree with me, and I think that maybe we should play like a 2-1, like a top, like two forwards and a center forward yeah. or something of that nature. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, the biggest thing there would be to kind of figure out what they're going to do in the midfield. Are they going to play with wings, or are they going to kind of compact uh, three players in the midfield, like a Bradley Jones, Beckerman, Tree, or something like that? It's, sure. That, that's going to be the biggest thing there is, you know, what they're going to do with the, uh, with the midfield, because they're not going to go away from the four, four-man back line. That is true, yeah. And uh, Somebody on Periscope says that, um, speaking about Josie Altsador, that um, we need to see more than one consistent game out of him before we can just start selling the house on him again. I- I've never really been a huge fan. I- anybody that knows me fairly well knows that I've never really liked Josie Altsador. I've never been a fan of the type of player that he is, and I think that he doesn't really need to be on the national team or Toronto, personally. But that maybe is just me being a little too uh, too harsh, I guess. But even still... Um, I like Zardis. I like Jordan Morris. I really like Bobby Wood. I just feel like this team has so much younger potential that they need to start getting reps. And these early World Cup qualifying games is the perfect time to do that. I mean, Chris, do you think that Jordan Morris needs to be on the field more than a sub? Oh, for sure. Give him a chance to, uh, you know, let him start the game similar to what they would bo- did with Bobby Bobby Wood. Excuse me. Um, you know, let him get into the flow of the game. I mean, yeah, as a substitute, you kind of come in, you got to find your way to whereas if you're starting, you know, everybody's starting off on the same level, I guess is the best way to put it. True. Um, and just let him, you know, he's, he's great off the bench once he gets into the game. But I mean, when he played uh, back in April against Mexico, you know, he was an early second half substitute, I believe, if I remember correctly, or maybe he started, I can't remember. I didn't get to watch the very beginning of the game, but you know, he came in, uh, as they say, imposed his will on that back line, and he scored. Absolutely, you know, it's it. I would love. I'm. I would love to see him. You know what? Let's put him and Bobby Wood. Let them start a game together. Let's see how they work with each other. Exactly. I have no problem with that. Why not? I think the game against um, the Grand Saint Vincent and the Grenadines has been a perfect opportunity to be like, you know what, guys? Yeah, we know this is a weaker squad, but we just kind of really just want to get a feeling for what you guys can do together on the field. Honestly. Most definitely, yeah. That's that. That's a great point. I I agree with you, and I don't. Remember, I know they don't play again until March, uh, and I don't have the schedule up here, so I don't know who they. Oh, I think they have Guatemala next, if I remember correctly. But I think you're right. You know, let, yeah, let them let them go up against Guatemala. Let those two guys start. Obviously, depending on if there's injuries or whatnot. But you know, sure. God forbid. But 
um, you know, give them a chance. You, there's only one way you're going to find out. You let them do it. Exactly. No, I completely agree with you on that one. Well, looking around the other uh, games that took place in this group, uh, Guatemala, as you just mentioned, Chris, pounded St. Vincent 4-0. Mexico ended their long drought against Honduras and beat them 2-0. Jamaica squeaked out a 1-0 victory against Haiti. El Salvador and Canada drew, uh, drew scoreless in that game. And Costa Rica outlasted Panama 2-1. Did any of those guys, uh, any of those games really stand out to either of you guys at all? I got a chance um, to watch the Mexico game. Um, it was... You know, it, it was a it was a very chippy affair. Um, just whistles, you know, beyond belief in the first half. Um, <clears throat> Got to send out uh, thoughts to Luis Garrido after that injury. Oh man, that was hard to watch. But uh, Mexico, uh, you know, it it took it took them a while. They kept uh, knocking away and knocking away. But when they finally broke through the dam, they just they were clearly the better team. Which makes sense, and I think like for Mexico, they needed that coming out party against um, a weaker Honduras team. So, uh, Chris, what were your thoughts about those other games? Uh, you know, uh, nothing really surprising to be honest with you. You know, Mexico is gonna you know do Mexico things and do what they should do. I knew they're they're, they're learning with a new coach. I swear it's like their twelfth in the last four years. <laughs> it seems like. Yeah, I, um, I agree on that one. The one, the one that I'm actually kind of interested in is Canada. Um, yep. They beat Honduras uh, last Friday, and then they drew 0-0 against El Salvador, which, you know, okay, um, down in El Salvador. So that that's no, you know, small accomplishment. No kidding, yeah. Um, they play Mexico at home March 25th next year. So that game, I, I'm going to probably go out of my way to watch that game because I'm really interested in that. Uh, Costa Rica's Costa Rica, Panama's Panama. Uh, I would, honestly, I'd love to see Haiti somehow make it out of there. I just don't see it happening. Sure. No, that, that makes sense. Now, I, I'm curious just to step aside from um, the United States soccer scene for a second. If a team like Italy or Spain or Germany were to have to go down to Trinidad or El Salvador and play on that smaller pitch in those weird conditions, would they have a chance to get upset, you think? Oh. Uh. That's a that's a good question. I mean, that pitch down there, like in Trinidad, for example, is really bumpy. Yep. The ball doesn't roll smooth. It is smaller, as you mentioned. The crowd, even you know, they're far away from the field with the track going around it and stuff. But uh, I think it, it, if it's the right team, you know, uh, uh, in the right circumstances, I mean, it, it, it could happen. I mean, it is soccer. I mean, true you know, or football, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, anything can happen. I mean. <laughs> No, I, I agree with you on that one. Matt, what are your thoughts about that possibility of um, a weird international friendly game? I think that if Germany went down to Trinidad and played down there, I think Germany would win 4 nothing. but all four goals would come after the 60th minute. I think it would take them at least a half to get used to the conditions, to get used to the, the heat, the humidity. I mean, that's the other thing last night. It was 81 degrees with 90% humidity. Those players were just sweating like nobody's business. My goodness. I think it would, take, it would take time to adjust, but I think that eventually after about a half of just kind of getting a feel of the field and of the weather and of the atmosphere, I think that in the second half, the talent would eventually take over and they'd win big. All right. Well, hey, well, we got to jump to a break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be back with more. It's time to review what is going on with the MLS Awards. And Chris and Matt want to dive into what's going on with the Seattle Sounders as we take a look at our MLS section next right here on 2 Up Front. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan tonight. Uh, he had a previous obligation that kept him out of the studio, so he'll be back next week. So you can catch Two Up Front, as you can right here every Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern on SportsRadioAmerica.com. And you can find us as well on uh, on demand, that's what I was going to say, on demand, on iHeartRadio, iTunes, and on Spreaker.com. Um, all right, well, we are being joined this evening by uh, Vavil USA co-hosts, uh, the soccer editors, the soccer gurus, the whatever titles you want to throw their way, basically everything. Uh, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans, good evening again to you, gentlemen. Chris, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Baxter. Fantastic. And Matt, how are you? Well, my Mountain Dew code red is now out, so I'm not as good as I was 10 minutes ago. Oh, no, that's not good. Um, oh, we have a question on Periscope. Uh, yes, go ahead, ask your question. I, you see you have a question, so go ahead and ask it. Um, somebody asked me during the break what my favorite UK team was. I said it was Arsenal. Uh, and then they heard, they heard you, Matt, say Stoke City, and they said nobody likes Stoke City, LOL. Um, but uh, I'm curious to know if this person does end up asking their question. I'll make sure to reiterate it on the air. But one of the things we want to do now is look at the uh, MLS Award winners of the year and uh, the teams that uh, or the teams, the players that have won the uh, the award so far. And um, let's start with uh, some of the more recent uh, awards that have been handed out. Uh, the awards that are coming up the next few days will be the MLS Goalkeeper of the Year Award, the Newcomer, the Coach, and of course, the uh, Landon Donovan MLS MVP, which I think is funny as heck. Um, oh, so the question on Periscope is, when will America start calling football games like calling it football like the rest of the world? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts about that question? We won't. We already have a football. It's American football. It's always going to be soccer. True. I agree with you. Chris? Oh, I'm, I'm the same. I mean, if we didn't have the NFL, we could possibly see it going to being called football. But it's either when you say football, you got to say American football. It just gets uh, dicey. It's, it's going to stay the soccer. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's agreed. Yeah, the person that's uh, buzzing us on Periscope is from Scotland, so they were curious to know. Uh, so okay, thank okay. you for that, uh, that makes thank you for watching. I, I appreciate that. All right. Um, so, Chris, let's start with you. Uh, some of the awards that have been handed out so far, have you been surprised in a, like, what the hell kind of surprise um, with any of the awards that have been given out yet? Uh, no. I mean, Rookie of the Year. Kyle, Laren. I always want to call him Sile. I don't know why. It looks Kyle. like Sile. When I, fr- I I said that, I was like Sile, Laren. Someone's like, it's Kyle. I'm like, um, really? No, he that that kid. You know, he <laughs> Orlando's got them a, a, a future star. Uh, well, he's already a star. Uh, MLS Defender of the Year, which I believe was uh, Laurent Simeon from Montreal. Yep. Um, he that dude's a beast. You know, I watched him during Concacaf uh, Champions League action. And I yep. was, came away very very impressed with him. Uh, Tim Mila, comeback player of the year. I won't say what I want to say. It's a little, but, it's a little bit of a head um, scratcher, considering that Will Trapp and Diego Valeri were also those guys up for the award. Maybe I just yeah. don't know enough about it. But what what happened to, to Tim Mila that made him so heroic? Uh, Does anybody got actually him in know? The playoffs. I don't know. Won the won the U.S. Open Cup. How oh, wait, can you that's be different? How Never can mind. you how can um, you be the comeback player of the year? When you, well, what, he, what he has to have overcome something. Okay, well, actually, as you were asking that question, I did a quick search. Um, basically, last year in 2014, he made two appearances for Chivas USA. That's enough to get you an award. True. Um, he, <laughs> he also uh, served as a league pool goalkeeper, uh, and he also he got to do some emergency call ups with Sporting KC, Dallas, DC United, yada yada yada. Yeah. Um. So that I think that's why, because essentially he was out of the league. He hasn't really started anything. I mean, he's been a backup his whole life. I suppose. So I can see um, the I can see the reasoning about that. Now I wanna I wanna take a quick moment. Actually, there was another good question that was asked from our friend from Scotland. It looks like you pronounce it or Oracle eighty four. They had a, asked a very interesting question. Um, he or she or it whoever that person is uh it's uh, the the that's hard to tell who the person is based off of their picture she okay thank you for clarifying uh she wants to know if the popularity over the last 10 years of major league soccer 
has grown in the United States solely because of David Beckham and how the United States has done at the World Cup. I know it's off script what we wanted to do, but I like the question. I like the concept of it. I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts about that. Chris, how would you? How, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, it definitely helped. I mean, getting Beckham, is since that was one of the examples she used, you know, once David Beckham arrived back, was that 07, I believe? Um, I think it was that long ago, yeah. Yeah, he it definitely helped because it changed the way the league did things. True. It created a designated player and so forth. And then it made it to where other big-time stars could actually come to the U.S., play Major League Soccer, and be successful. And it's becoming a better league. I mean, it's not. It's a long ways away from Garver's hope of being a top league in the world. But it's definitely helped. Uh, the U.S., as you can see last year, a lot of the U.S. national team players – they came from MLS. As much as Jurgen says he hates his players playing for MLS, that squad he put out against Germany and Belgium was over 50% MLS players. It's And the popularity has just gotten huge. I mean, it's... I remember five, six years ago walking... Now, Seattle's its, all, its own thing, but just going different places and hearing other people talk about soccer to whereas 10 years ago, you didn't hear about that. You hear soccer and people laugh. True. You know, it, it's definitely changed. Beckham helped. The United States Minnesota national team... You know, they made the knockout rounds back-to-back World Cups for the first time ever. I really, you know, it, it, the popularity is there. They're doing the promotions right. It, it's it. They're definitely, it's going to just get better. I agree. Matt, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, we had, a, just to reiterate for those that just tuned in, uh, we had somebody on Periscope ask a question saying whether or not the growth of Americans, uh, the uh, growth of soccer in the United States has was significantly affected over the last 10 years because of David Beckham coming over and the success that the U.S. men's national team is coming. So, Matt, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree completely to what Chris said there. I mean, because realistically, you know, David Beckham, when he came over, that was the reason for the, the designated player. And, you know, rule changes to that allowed teams to be able to spend and bring in, you know, international talent, you know, names that people recognize. I think that the thing that's really interesting now is the fact that uh, you're seeing that uh, Major League Soccer is being, is being watched in like 140 countries. I think there's, yeah. just a deal today, there's just a deal today where like Fox announced that uh, like Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be getting Major League Soccer games. I mean, it's just, it's, it's incredible to see how the league is growing and to see how talented the team, the, you know, the, the teams are and the players. You're starting to see, you know, these teams like Trinidad, they're, they're starting to be littered with Major League Soccer talent and St. Vincent and, you know, the Caribbean nations here. And now even, like we mentioned, Laurent Simon, you know, he's a Belgium international playing in, in Major League Soccer. That's something that would have been unheard of seven years ago. True. No, that's completely true. I mean, it, it's great to see how huge American soccer has grown. Certainly it does help the fact that uh, the United States' mid of success at the World Cup, especially with the women, uh, definitely helps. Uh, they're asking another question. I mean, I like these questions. They're very uh, thought-provoking here. Another question that was asked is, as for the fans, do you receive the same as Europe uh, in terms of chanting and the build-up to derby games as well? Matt, uh, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> yes. Um, Seattle-Portland games are as close to Europe as you're going to get here in the United States. And, you know, uh, it's just the, just the, 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 not just, it, it's the hatred. I mean, seriously, t- Sounders fans and Timbers fans, we hate each other. And it is something that is, it, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I got a chance to go to my first Cascadia game this year and I, I just, just blown away. Absolutely blown away. Chris, your thoughts? Uh, I'm right there with, with Matt. Um, you know, I've done, the Portland Seattle thing, three, four, three away trips. Which going down to Providence Park, it's sight lines are horrible, but it's a great atmosphere. I'll, I'll give it to the Timbers Army; they bring it every game. You know, sure. I've done the Vancouver thing, but yeah, it's definitely the, the the hatred is there. I mean, I remember this summer. Quick, real quick story is my wife and I. We went in the end of June, went down to watch the Senators play the Timbers, and my wife and I parked our car. Walk, you know, we're walking to the stadium to meet up with some friends, and we had somebody, two, a couple Timbers fans walk by us. You know, it was nothing bad. All they did is they looked at us and said, well, that's unfortunate because, you know, we're wearing our <laughs> Sounders stuff. That's what I expect. You know, it was I, – I've heard horror stories about other things going on between Sounders and Timbers fans, but we won't get into that. But, yeah, it's – it, it, it gets pretty. It gets pretty rowdy, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to hear because I mean, if you even think about that, even fifteen years ago, 
in Major League Soccer, people would be like, oh, stop. You know, like even 10 years ago, like I think the Seattle to Portland rivalry is one of the big catalysts for the growth of soccer in America. And I, I'm very thrilled about that. So um, looking at the kind of going back. So thank you for the questions. Um, there were more that were asked as well, but we need to kind of roll on with the show. But thank you for those questions from all the way from Scotland. I appreciate it. And uh, good answers from you guys as well. Now, I want to talk about uh, specifically in MLS what's going on with the Seattle Sounders. And um, just for a few moments, uh, Matt, you've prepared something for us this evening, and uh, I'd like to like to give the floor to you, sir, and hear what um, what thing you have prepared for us. So why don't you give the fans a little bit of a prequel what you're about to do? Okay, so basically the, the state of the Seattle Sounders for me <clears throat> is they're in a state of transition right now. Uh, I don't see a full-scale rebuild happening this offseason, but the end for the aging Sounders core is near. Um, Seattle Sounders... Um, uh, General Manager Garth Lagerway uh, said today to the media that uh, he thinks we're an old team and over the next couple of years we need to get younger. We're also a good team, so it's not something where you can necessarily attack and make radical changes. He also continued with, we're trying to build a roster that's sustainable, while at the same time understanding that given the ages of our best players, we have to take another shot at it next year. We have to try and win MLS Cup, which is absolutely true. They have to win MLS Cup next year or else the team has to be gutted. One of the biggest issues right now for Seattle is that they're extremely tight to the salary cap and that they don't have any international spots available. Those spots are all tied up with players who are either vital to the starting core right now, in like Obafemi Martin, Nelson Valdez, Tyrone Mears, Ivan Schitz, and Roman Torres, or players who are in your future plans, like O'Neill Fisher, Tomas, and Damian Lowe. In regards to the salary cap, Seattle may, may only need to make one or possibly two moves to free up some space. There are rumors that Osvaldo Alonso is being shipped around the league, while that would be disappointing to see probably the Sounders' most popular player dealt, it would free up around $750,000 against the cap to use in other places. Gonzalo Pineda is another player who saw his playing time decrease as the, as the season went on. He was even passed over once Alonzo went down with injury as Ziggy Schmidt opted for a central midfield pairing of Eric Freeberg and Andy, Andy Rhodes. Pineda is making $160,000 according to the MLS Players Union salary chart. Lagerway also mentioned players <clears throat> mulling retirement. He did not mention any players by name, but the thought that Leo Gonzalez could be one of those players. Um, O'Neill Fisher saw a majority of the playing time down the stretch, and the left-back spot is full as it is full mm-hmm. with young players like Dylan Remick and Andreas Correa. Gonzalez leaving would also free up about $165,000. One, one player that I'd like to see on this team next year is Jordan Morris. We talked about him already. Lagerway said today that the team offered Morris the, quote, richest homegrown contract in MLS history, and for good reason. Morris, unlike the homegrown forwards that have come before him, has actually proved himself on an international level just how good he is instead of the thought of how good he could be in players like Darwin Jones and Victor Manzare. So that's my thoughts right there. (laughs) Just a few things. My goodness. Well, no, I completely agree with you on that one. I mean, let's be honest, uh, Seattle didn't exactly have the greatest season. I mean, you can be happy from the perspective that they made a fairly decent run in the playoffs. They outlasted... uh, the tournament that you know yeah. that, that took place. I mean, they finally finally beat the Galaxy, but yeah. uh, realistically, though, I mean, if you had to assign a letter grade to how Seattle's uh, performance was this season, Chris, what would you give them? Um, I'll be, <laughs> I'll run it right down the middle. I'll just say a C, just because. Just, I think the thing that hurt them the most was obviously when they lost Ova for two months. True. Uh, lost Dempsey because he decided to tear up the referee Daniel Radford's notebook. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think what they really, and I agree with everything Matt just said, um, they got a great goalkeeper. Their back line's aging with Chad Marshall, Zach Scott, who honestly he'll probably be one of the other guys that will probably retire. I mean, hell, he played the whole season with a broken foot. True. Um, you know, where they lack for years, they had nothing but forwards, forwards, forwards. We had no midfielders, so if we lost a midfielder, they were, you know, SOL. Well, now we have so many midfielders that we don't have enough forwards. Mm. So when you lose somebody like a Clint Dempsey or an Ova Femi Martins, now no disrespect to these guys, but you're putting Lamar Nagel, who plays better when Ova and Dempsey are out there, you having him start up front, or you're having Chad Bear start up front, which I love them both. Don't get me wrong. Oh, absolutely. But they're not, they're not your typical yes they could start on another team in the league 
but they're not good. And I hate to say this because I, I really do love the guys. They're both great guys. I've met them, but they're not good enough for the team to uphold that production that uh, Martins or Dempsey gives you. So what mm-hmm. they need to do is they need to sign Jordan Morris. Honestly, I read some comments on the article today that was put out about it. Somebody hit it right on the head. I think this might happen is once the college season's over, once the playoffs or the tournament's over, he signs in December. So we're talking two, three, four weeks down the road. That would be great. And he's gonna get his then he's gonna get his call up. He's gonna come back. He's gonna get prepared for the CONCACAF Champions League game against Club America in February. That's personally what I think he's gonna do. Um, but overall it's a season. I mean it's a C it, just think if they don't have that horrible two month stretch, who knows how good they could have been and where they could have been. They could have been seated number one or number two. That is very and true. And who knows that it, it, at that point everything changes. Instead of playing three games in eight days, you're now playing two games in two weeks. So, I agree. No, I absolutely agree. All right, Matt, what is your grade? Uh, very briefly before we have to jump off to a break. B minus. B minus. Same thing as Chris. Yeah, same thing as Chris. You know, we have we don't have that that horrible stretch in the middle of the season. We could have been supporter shield and not have to worry about three games in eight days. Fair enough. All right, well, we're going to jump to a break. When we come back, we're going to take a look and offer our predictions for the first leg of MLS Conference Championship action as the Portland Timbers will take on FC Dallas and the Columbus Crew will take on the Red Bulls. Matt, Chris, and I will have our predictions for the first leg. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be back with more right after this on 2 Up Front. Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this evening. He is off for the week, but he'll be back next week, so don't worry. If you do want to follow Simon, though, and his witty soccer knowledge, you can find him on Twitter at Simon Provan. You can find myself at Baxter Colburn. And you can follow the show's Twitter at Two Up Front Soccer. And you can follow us on Facebook as well. You can like our Facebook page, Two Up Front. You can find newest articles, news, information about the show, and other guest appearances and other fun things that we do on the show there. That is Two Up Front on Facebook and at Two Up Front Soccer on Twitter. All right, not a lot of time left in the show, but we do have one more segment before we uh, do our final segment. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Vavil USA Soccer Division editors uh, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans. So thanks again, guys, for tuning in and for uh, being a part of the show tonight. Chris, I'm going to jump right into it with you. Looking at the conference championship games in Major League Soccer, the Columbus Crew and the New York Red Bulls, did you have any inkling at all that it would be the Crew and Red Bulls in this conference championship game? At the beginning of the year, no, not at all. Um, but as the season progressed, uh, most definitely you could see that those they were clearly the the, the two best teams in the East. Um, you know, they played three times this year. New York won the series, season series two to one, hmm. um, outscoring. Let's see. Actually, all three of the games were two to one. Wow! Imagine that. Um, so you know, if that continues, then you know New York will be hosting MLS Cup. Um, but you know, they they both teams are really stacked. Uh, Columbus has Kai Kamara with twenty four goals, Ethan Finley with thirteen, Federico Higuain. Yeah, I know I said that wrong. Sorry, nine Higuain. And then uh, thank you, Higuain. Oh then, my uh, gosh, where do we find yeah, these you know, people? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like David Villa, right? No. Exactly. Um, New York Red Bulls, uh, BWP eighteen goals. Lloyd Sam ten. Mike Grella, who could who, who could win New York new, newcomer of the year, got nine goals. Um, they're two great teams. Um, 
it, once we got past the halfway point, I would definitely say I, I kind of saw these two uh, being the two finalists, especially after that Hurt and Columbus crew put on DC United in the final game of the regular season. I think it was 4 nothing or something like that. So yeah. at that point, they definitely showed they were legitimate. Absolutely. Matt, your thoughts about this uh, crew Red Bulls game? Going to be a great, going to be a great series. Um, <clears throat> in Columbus, uh, there's not really a big um, difference head to head. Columbus has won 17 of the all time meetings. The Red Bulls have won 12 of the all time meetings. So it's not really that, that the history doesn't really have anything to do there. But I think Columbus is just uh, they're. I think they got it. I think they're good enough to where they can get a big enough victory in, in leg one to win, to advance past leg two. Okay, so let me uh, let me get your score prediction then for leg one between Columbus and New York, Matt. Uh, two nothing Columbus. Interesting, Chris. I was gonna go one one with New York getting that critical away uh, goal, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna go one one. Okay, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go uh, two one Columbus. I think Columbus is gonna do some. I think New York is gonna still grab that one goal. But I think Columbus is going to end up prevailing in the end. All right, uh, looking over at the West. Now, I I know, I know both of you never saw this coming. (laughs) But Portland and FC Dallas. Chris, we'll start with you this time. Did you think that these guys were going to be there? No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, Dallas, I figured they would start hot, cool off, and we'd forget about them. But they changed. Oscar Pereira did a great job of keeping his team uh, in line, essentially, and, and got them there. And they're clearly the best team. they got so much talent. Look what they they, they ran the Sounders into the ground. No kidding. Uh, Portland, Portland. I mean, you never know with Portland. Is it going to be the Portland of 2013 to where they kind of slowly got out and then made a run at the end? You, you just never know what's going to show up. Uh, they played twice this year. Portland won 3-1 to one at home. Dallas won four to one. At Oof! Home. So not so, exactly a happy medium between these two teams. Exactly. In, in the last five games, there you know the each team has two wins and a draw, two two draw. So I mean it, it can go any way. Um, I think what might what Dallas could do to actually slow Portland down is if you look at the score sheet, Fernando Adi has seventeen goals. <laughs> their next, their next is Darlington Nagby with six, Ouch. and then you're. Three with six, and in that Borchers, a center back with four. You look hmm. at Dallas; you got Castillo with ten, Mario Diaz with nine, Michael Barrios with seven, and Tesho Akindeli with seven. So, so they're more balanced on that. So I, I they shut down Audi. They can they can win that series. I'm just going to tell you now: Dallas is going to win the series. Okay, they're going to shut Audi down. It's going to be two one Dallas. Two one Dallas first leg. Matt, your thoughts about the first leg of action? I agree that uh, all Dallas needs to do is shut down Audi because uh, there really hasn't been another proven uh, goal scorer for Portland. But Dallas has never won in Portland in six te- trips up there, two draws, four losses. So I got Portland 2-1 uh, to one in the first leg. How much did that pain you to say Portland actually is going to win a game? Yeah, it's, it was very difficult to say. I'm going to have to go take a shower now. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, I mean, in this game, it's it's hard for me to really debate against Portland at home because they're usually a fairly good team at the home, at the home stadium. But uh, Fabian Castillo, though, what he's been doing for FC Dallas has been fantastic. Even Akindeli as well. I mean, one of the better young, underrated forwards. I'm sure Can- Canada's thrilled by having him on their team. Um, oh, I, definitely. I really want... I- I, I believe, as much as I want, I think FC Dallas is going to win. Uh, I think they're going to put a bit of a spanking on them. I think they're going to win 3-1. to one. I wow. think what might hurt Portland, though, is they have two of their big playmakers, Will Johnson and Darlene Tignagby, coming off World Cup qualifiers. So they didn't get that two weeks of rest like everybody else did. That's true. I think that'll hurt their midfield. Long trips, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they're coming from long, long trips. All right. Well, um, so you heard the predictions from us. Uh, let us know your thoughts. You can get us on Twitter at 2 up front Soccer at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan. Let us know your predictions for the first legs of the MLS Conference Championships. We're going to take one more break. When we come back, Matt, Chris, and I are going to wrap up the show with our I Believe segment, and we will be taking off for another edition of 2 up front. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn, no Simon Provan this evening. As we finish up a exciting edition, we've talked about the Euros, we've talked about, no, not the Greek dish, no, uh, the Euro 2016s. Uh, we talked about Messi and Ronaldo, we talked about the state of U.S. soccer, we talked about the Seattle Sounders, the MLS playoffs, we've talked about everything, and uh, we've come to the part of the show that uh, is probably my favorite part of the show. It is our I Believe segment, which I know makes... You hear that chant, and many folks around the the world are like, Ah, oh, America! And they pound their chest proudly and salute, and a bald eagle, I'm sure, flies by along with the Blue Angels on a flyover. Anyway, that's very America of us. Anyway, but uh, the way the I Believe segments work, um, for those of you that don't know, uh, myself and my two co-hosts for the evening, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans of Vavil USA, will offer a statement about something we believe that will happen in the soccer world. So, for example, this is not my real one, but just for an example, I believe that uh, FC Dallas will score 15 goals in the two-leg series against Portland Timbers. That's not my actual one, but that is just an example so you get an idea of what we're doing. So, uh, Matt and Chris, you guys both have your I Believe segments ready to roll. Matt, are you, you ready to roll on yours? Ready to roll. Okay, well, uh, Matt, I'll actually, you know what? I'm going to give you the floor first, Matt. So it is all you, sir. Oh, Matt, did I lose? I think I may have lost them. Shoot. Oh, hang on a second. Technical difficulties. This is what happens when you uh, have too many devices going at once. Um, Hold on a second, guys. I'm coming back. There we go. Are you guys there? Yep. There we go. Sorry, someone decided someone decided to uh, call me or something. So um, we're back now. Although I, I feel I can hear myself though through your speakers. So I don't know if you need to turn me down or what, but I, I sound very loud on your end. Yeah, turn down. There we go. Okay, Matt, back to you, sir. What is your I believe segment? Now this is going to be this is very difficult to say, but I believe that in two and a half weeks that the final MLS team celebrating at the end of the season will be the Portland Timbers winning <gasps> MLS Cup. Really? Yes. Good Lord. He's lost his mind. Wow. wow. I, I believe that Matt has lost his mind. No, that's not my I believe. Chris, what's your I believe segment? Is it as outlandish as what Matt's was? I, I still can't process he said that. <laughs> um, I think okay. everybody in Seattle is going to go find Matt's house and egg it tonight. Um, I know we briefly touched on it earlier. Um, I really do believe that Jordan Morris will sign the quote-unquote most lucrative homegrown player contract in MLS history sometime before the start of the 2016 MLS season. Interesting. Okay. Well, my, uh, my I Believe segment is going to roll with the U.S. men's national team. And uh, I believe that Bobby Wood will be given a real and true chance over the next few qualifier games, and he's going to assert himself as a consistent starting forward for the U.S. men's national team. So that's what I believe about it. That's what Chris and Matt believe. So thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Two Up Front. It's been a lot of fun. Remember, there was no Simon Proven tonight, but we still managed. We talked a lot about the Seattle Sounders. So that's probably why we were able to get by with it, because otherwise Simon would have freaked out. But my co-hosts this evening have been Vavil USA's finest, Chris Blakely, Matt Evans. Chris, thank you so much, sir, for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to do it again. Absolutely. And Matt, sir, it's always a pleasure. I look forward to uh, seeing what you guys bring to Vavil USA's soccer division next. Sounds good, man. Thank you. All right. Well, they are Chris Blakely and Matt Evans. Uh, real quickly, Matt, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, they can find me at Tenorman85. Uh, shoot me a follow. I'll follow you back. Love talking soccer. Absolutely. And Chris, where can people find you? The real C. Blakely, that's B-L-A-K-E-L-Y. So oh. give me a follow and we'll chit-chat it up. Sounds good. All right, once again, Chris Blakely and Matt Evans. I am Baxter Colburn for Simon Provan. Thanks again for listening to Two Up Front right here on Sports Radio America. Remember, you can get us on demand on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and on Spreaker.com, and right here from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on SportsRadioAmerica.com. Follow us on Twitter at Two Up Front Soccer, at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan. With our manager being the one above, we are two up front.